everyone. It's actually uh, really, uh, really great to be here. And I mean, as it's been said before, really the introduction is more intimidating than anything else. Uh, so anyway, today we're going to talk a little bit about resiliency, and I want to start with uh, with a, a video. So let's start with this. Maybe you've seen it on Twitter uh, not too long ago, but. You see, this is, think about that person that crosses the street as a request. Right? Your request starts to hit the server, and, oh. <laughs> exactly. So how many of you in the audience have somehow been a victim of outages or, let's say, cas Catastrophic failures like this, right? And actually, the funny part of this video is not necessarily the falling, is when we try to bring the system back up, right? It just doesn't work. And actually, most of the outages, well, they happen very fast, but what is very hard to do is to bring them back up, right? So that's actually quite an interesting video. And really, this video is because distributed systems are hard, right? And we've been talking about it. And if you look at constellations of some of those companies like Amazon, Netflix, Twitter, these even now are quite old, right? It's a lot of different services. And you don't have to be Twitter or Amazon or Netflix to have a complicated architecture. Actually, we say usually if you have five or six services already, I can ask any architect to give me all the combinations of things that can possibly go wrong. And that's super hard. Right? So basically, normal testing and things like what we used to do on Monolith really don't quite work. And that's what we call really resiliency. Right? Basically, when you take a system like this, at any point in time, it's pretty much impossible that everything will work. Statistically, statistics, statistically that's a hard word, it's almost impossible that everything is running, right? Because there's so many of those. And that's exactly what we call resiliency, right? Resiliency is the heart of running a system which might have parts that are actually not working at that time. And I want to show you a little video that exactly explains well what resiliency is and how I see my job. So this is a taxi driver uh, in India and he has a, a wheel problem, basically. His wheel is not working anymore. But he doesn't stop. Uh, he still delivers his customer to this destination, right? And that's exactly what resiliency is, is how do we keep system running and do what they're supposed to do when things go wrong, right? And that's a brilliant case of what we call partial failure mode. Uh, and the whole art of resiliency is actually to be able to run in these modes. So how do we build resilient system? Well, if you ask most people, the most common answer is going to be, of course, infrastructure. Right? But it actually doesn't stop here. It starts from the infrastructure, goes up to the network, up to the application, and actually goes up to people. And people is a very, very, very important part of resiliency. And I'll talk about some of the chaos attack that we've done with some companies that I've been working with, where we do people attack. And it doesn't mean we break the necks of people. We just take the laptop and tell, today you, not come, you don't come to work, but you'll just go home and without your laptop. And then we see how the operations happen. Because we all have this person in your company that does pretty much everything, knows everything. Is like, we call it Paul. I call it Paul because I had three Pauls in my previous lives, and they were genius at doing everything. Right? But you know, the bus effect is pretty big, right? If Paul gets killed by a bus, then what happened? So this is something we need to talk about. Right? So when you build resilient system, you have to think about the whole stack. And I want to talk about a few of those uh, things that have to, to be done. And I have only 30 minutes, so, and I want to show some demos as well. So I've just picked some of those that I think uh, I've more important, and especially those that I've learned through failures, right? Because most of this talk is based on things that I pretty much fucked up in production, or things that I broke. 
The first thing which is really, really important is to think about bulk heading and isolation. Because we all know blast radius, right? And when things go wrong, the first thing you want to hear is how many of your customers have been affected. And then hopefully as little as possible. You say, okay, we have an outage, but only 1% of our customers are affected. Versus, okay, we have an outage, everyone is affected. And that's very important. So it makes you think about how do you design system that actually can control that blast radius. And this is how we do it at AWS, okay? Um, you know, we've, if you use AWS, and I'm sure some of you are, uh, we tend to say to people, hey, you always have to architect your application across three AZs, and AZ is availability zones, right? And that's also the patterns that we do in-house. But for us, when we have millions of customers and some of our services go up to 20 million requests per second, it's quite important that we limit the blast radius. So what we do is we take a typical application, we take a multi-AZ design, and it has its own set of databases. We federate user, we uh, do all that uh, so that you know, we don't have all our users in one database. We have many different databases. We do sharding, all the typical technique that you would want to do. And then we call that a cell. And then we deploy multiple cells. Right? So we actually can have, for some of our services, like DynamoDB, as thousands or tens of thousands of cells. Right? And these are big infrastructures, right? because they take, literally, DynamoDB can go up for 20 million requests per second. So those are big big architectures. And what we do with these cells is we simply put a very thin router layer, right? So that then we can, you know, move traffic and, and push requests per people, per customer to the particular cells that they are using. And the interesting thing with this kind of stuff is, of course, uh, we can isolate workloads. But for, so for our regional services like S3, DynamoDB, or all these ones that are in one region, that means that we can isolate these in cells, right, across regions. So if one cell goes down, we still don't affect all our users. But we also do this for our uh, availability zone uh, aware, our local uh, aware uh, zonal services. So then we have millions of cells in some of the regions. So that's the first thing we, uh, we do. And this is a very simple thing to do, of course, and is allows us to scale, right? What we do is we take a cell, we make it as small as possible, maybe just put 1,000 users in there, and then instead of scaling up, we scale horizontally. And that's quite simple to do. But if we talk a little bit more about blast reduce, it's still quite big, right? Because having a whole cell going down is still very damaging. So what do we do? I'll take an example of, let's say, a service that has a bunch of instances, and we have a bunch of users. So it's, let's say, eight users here. Typically, in a service, what they do is they, make, they go through load balancers, and then those users are spread across multiple instances. This is how most services work. So the problem with this is if, for example, Diamond makes this request, like we saw at the beginning, that starts to hit the servers, and then one server has issue treating that request. Well, typical client, what they do is a retry, right? So that already all the, all the clusters of servers that are serving those customers basically go down. And that's terrible for us. Because the blast radius is equal to the number of customers. In the cell-based architectures, when we bring that, you know, we just put a few sets of customer per sales. So that means, in that case, if my diamond still has this expensive request, then it doesn't touch the other one. But here, my blast reduce is still 25%, which is pretty terrible, because we don't have eight users. Right? We literally have tens of thousands of, of users, of millions of users, sorry. So the blast reduce here is proportional to the number of cells. So what we do, we do a new technique, and that's uh, a very interesting technique called shuffle sharding. Let me tell you how this works. So see, for example, uh, we still have our eight users, but what we do is we distribute randomly those users across at least two instances in that case. And what we do is, for all the other ones, we do the same. Right? So basically, each user gets combinations of 
different, different servers. And we do that through a hash, a hash right, that is assigned for users, and then multiply that across different instances. So in that case, with the same request, Diamond now actually affects two different users, but through retry, you know, art, and won't be, won't be affected. And the same with, uh, I never remember how it's called this. Icon, right? <laughs> it still survives. In that case, we actually have no errors. The only thing that you, uh, you have to do from the client side is a retry. So in that case, the blast radius is proportional to the number of combinations that we do assign users on our, uh, on our servers, right? And if you think about this, with only eight users here, we reduce, if you have an overlap of two, we reduced from 25% blast reduced to 3.6, right? But for hundreds of nodes, if you do an overlap of five, you see the blast reduce is way, way, way below. And that's actually how we build most of our big services like uh, S3 and uh, Route, Route 53, DNS servers, and things like this. So this is one of the b most important things. And simply, Math and then a retry. So it sounds very simple, but you know, uh, previously we were not doing it. Another thing that is very important and that you learn the hard way is when you have an outage, it means you already have problems in your environment, right? And the most common thing to do when you have an outage is to have a system react to the outage, right? And that sounds terrible because, for example, if you have, let's say, an application here that is spread across you know, several availability zones, and say your application needs four instances or four containers to run your application. In that case, if I have one AZs that go down, well, my application still needs four containers. So what it will do while having an outage is try to restart instances and containers. And actually, most of the time, when you have an outage, the data plane is having issues. Right? So you're trying to make API calls to a data plane that is experiencing outages and try to bring back an environment to its stability. Right? So most of the time, this doesn't work. So what you have to do is maybe doing with eight, well, no, because of course here your blast reduce is pretty enormous, and you also run in a situation when you can have what we call overload. And overload is say you take all your traffic from one set of instances and bring back to the other. And that's number three reasons for most of outages out there. Right? Because we don't necessarily think about that. You see the mom nicely gives attention, all of a sudden one baby goes down and shifts everything to the other, which creates that uh, failure. And that's simply overload. So what you can do is try to figure out about your system and design it so that in the worst condition, what can you do not to do anything and then still survive? So in that case, you would, you know, your, inst your application still need four containers, but what you do, you put six of them so that in case of failures, you still can manage your application. So basically, you react without reacting. And that sounds like trivial or simple, but we tend not to think about it. Um, so SRE is like it was told in before, come with this idea of everything is going to fail, right? And that's actually very important when you design system. So that's a good way of doing it. Another thing I want to talk is a little bit about timeouts, back off, and retries, because how many Python developers here are there? Somewhere? Can someone tell, tell me quickly the default timeout for request library in Python? How many people have used the GDBC driver from MySQL? Come on. You've all connected to MySQL, right? What's the default timeout? Ah, uh, take bets. Interesting thing is everyone realizes the big problem here. So if you look at libraries and dependencies, you will figure out actually that most timeouts are, and default timeouts are close to infinite. 
right? Zero, close to infinite, minus one, default system. So that means you actually inherit from the system. So that means different system, different default. And are either 30 minutes in the case of, uh, of Tomcat, of, of servlets, all those ones. After a long time, 30 minutes is infinite time in the life of, of a, a request, right? And Python and many of kind of cool language, which I love Python, is infinite timeout. Same for a GDBC driver. And let me tell you what happens when you actually use the default timeout. So see, I make a request to my application. My application makes a request to the database. Classic, my database starts to experience issue because there's a lot of traffic, concurrent connection. The database starts to slow down. Of course, my request takes a lot more time to establish. Well, if I have a timeout of 10 seconds and a default timeout in the back end, what do you think is going to happen? Well, you know, if my request times out from the client side, then the back end never closes the connection. I'm going to keep having connections open, right? You see where it's going there. How many of you have experienced that message? Java developers here? Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Connection pools ran out. They run out of connection pools. What happens if you run out of connection pools? Usually, your server stops asking connections, and then your client goes to the next servers and runs out and cascading failures. And we go back to the first person that tries to cross the road. So that's terrible, right? So what you can do is, of course, there's two things you need to do. Think about your timeouts. Set them. Don't use default ever. Always document. And try to inherit the timeout from the client, actually. You know, in your request, you can have the request time, you know, the initiate time, and then the timeout from the client so that your backend doesn't stay just hanging if your client times out. And actually, the best, if you can do it, is if your client, client time out, then make sure you close all or drain all the connection or everything that that request has caused. And that's very important. Another thing you can talk of and do, and we was talk uh, in the previous talk, is to back off. You know, it's basically, instead of doing an immediate retry, because I'll show you what an instant retry can do. This is an application that I love, uh, I love to, uh, to use and show people. Oh, so, uh, so, here I have Well, of course. So this is a, a, a simple application. And you see on my screen here is basically what is happening, right? The retry happens every second. You know, the problem is not necessarily the retries happen every second. There's two things that happen. It congests the network, and it kills your instances with logs. Have you ever had outages created by logs filling up the hard drive? How many of you? Right, and you know what's the problem, huh? You run out of space, you can't open network connection. Right? That's mostly because you have too much log. Actually, that's an outage I've had in real life. Uh, we had the retries, and we were like, yeah, we have retries and stuff. Retry killed the whole environment because it was all logging that stuff. Right? So be very careful as well. Another thing you have to be careful is start doing the back off. But the problem with back off is that, right? Because we were doing back off, uh, but what we realize in distributed system, if every system starts to back off at the same time, they still retry at the same time. And you know, you create congestion like you see. You see, no jitter on the left. It's a standard back off, 2, 4, 8, 16. Well, your query patterns are still very, very bad for your system. So what you have to do, and this is super important, and that will solve many of your outages due to overload, is add jitter in your retry. Right? And I'll show you what it is in real life. Uh, so you you see my retry here? OK, OK, of course. Ooh, 
is called Expo? Maybe. I never remembered the API. No? Ah, yeah, it was Expo. No, it's not. Is it back? No? Ah, sorry, that. Yeah. It has to be this one. Let me check the API quickly. Yes, it's called Task Expo. So I put the task. OK, cool. All right, and now what you do is you retry six seconds, every six seconds, and then you wait. Then you have another retry, 26 seconds. So it's a back off, right? And the system is a lot more verbose. You know, it gives actually a lot of time for uh, SREs to start looking at it and, and see, OK, what might be the problem? And the most important thing here is actually that the most, cause, uh, the most problem with outages is when you bring them back up, right? And what it does, this is actually allows you to bring them back up way more slowly because usually outages are fixed within 45, one hour, right? But actually what takes a lot of time is draining out all the queues and all the systems. And usually that's because they've implemented exponential back off with a jitter so that it takes a lot of time to recover. All right. So just add jitter that will do wonder. And I'm not kidding, this is really life savior. And if you are into having a very good implementation of best practices, use Secret Breaker, right? I know it was made very popular with Strix uh, for, for Net by Netflix. What it does is actually forces the backend developer to think about the whole thing. A, a Secret Breaker is instead of querying directly a dependency, you wrap it in an object, and that object moni monitor for failures, right? And see, or oh, if the system has failed two or three times, you break. And that implements a fallback. And when you create that object, you have to give it a fallback. And that's super important. So circuit breaker definitely is something you want to talk about. But there's something even more important, because even Netflix is going out of using a circuit breaker. And we are also uh, internally looking more to what we call load shading. And load shading is quite simple. Is you look at the latency versus throughput. Uh, and every system has a limit, basically. And you say, OK, as soon as my latency increases, it probably means that there is a problem, right? And if that latency increases too high, it means my client is going to time out on a request that could have been good, right? That's what we call brownout. Right? It means your system is actually too to use, there's so much CPU running to execute a task fast enough, and then the client timeouts. So, oh, five minutes, wow. So that's something you really have to look up. And a good way to do that is actually to look at that limit and latency. And instead of trying to do those requests, regardless, just reject them. Right? and ask the client to retry, because the simple retry from the client will simply hit another server. And that's OK. Right? That's OK. Uh, simply retry. And that's a very good way to be resilient. Say, my server says, sorry, I'm too busy to take your request. I'll reject it. And that's a very good way of doing it. OK, I lost battery now. There you go. That's called. Another important thing is actually using queues, right? And queue, especially to make the API separate it from the workers. Because in a case of degradation, when you're experiencing an outage, it's actually a very good way to start prioritizing requests. Right? And this pattern is actually very, very nice. Of course, if you use Redis, you have to make sure <laughs> that you're writing to disk fast enough. Or otherwise, you should maybe use a system like RabbitMQ that is by default on disk. On the database level, something very interesting is imp has to be done as well. And something very simple. Most of databases support a read and write charting. Right? So use that as a re resiliency uh, 
capability. You, you move your writes to your master and then move the read to the read replicas. And some system can have up to 15 read replicas. So that gives you a lot of capability. And this is used extensively to do maintenance work. So for example, if you have to repair your uh, master database, you can switch into a read-only mode and serve either static content from your cache or just read from database. Right? And actually, funnily enough, uh, this morning, Redis was down. And this was, they were simply doing database maintenance. Uh, this is from the Twitter feeds. Uh, Twitter here. They're doing a maintenance database. And the whole site went out. Why? You know, you can always think about how to, how to move into a read-only mode or even serve stole data from cache. Right? So this is something important to do. In the database, also something that is caused a lot of outage is transient state. If you're going to store data into the database, make sure your data is not mutating later. Take your database and think of it as life credits. Uh, if you're going to store data into a database, don't store counter data. I've had outages because we use database to do counters, and counters are update query that lock the database. And if you have a lot of concurrent connections, they will take your database down. And I've seen this happen, and then through cascading failures, taking all the database down from the from uh, the application. So make sure you use other uh, cache systems or in-memory uh, system to do transient state like counters or sets, reverse sets, or things like this. And then let's talk a little bit chaos engineering. At this moment, I would talk about chaos, but the person before me talked about it. So I want to show you something, a project that we uh, use or that I used a lot in my previous companies. And I started, I, I did a bit of demos on that. But what we were doing basically with our back end developers to get them used to resiliency, we would, I would ask them to do two things exactly two APIs one API, put product, get product, and then the health check. And then do this in a compose, Docker compose environment so you can do all that stuff locally. And then we would go in through, sorry, and through breaking things randomly. So here I have my old Docker environment, and I can, you know, I can, I can start to put stuff. I already have a multicolor, so I have to do another product. Uh, and you can see I have a, a read replica here. Oh, I need to reconnect. Sorry. Uh, I have now my product here. Multicolor two, and then this is the master. Uh, so that if I get the product, I can do something like whoops, of course, my big fingers. So that all good now. The master database is working. Uh, we get the data. But now what we would do is something like this: you do a peer uh, DS. And then you grab and you say, OK, let's kill master. All right, so now I take my. And then it's really a way, good way to incentivize developers to chaos engineering. Because, and it's simple. You take an application with five components, right? And you try to ask your developers to make them as resilient as possible. All right, so now if I do a health check. On that, you see I'm going to have my master database is down, OK? All right, so can I still do my read? Oh, yeah, I can. Uh, so you see now the system has noticed that the master database is, is down, so I'm forcing. And now you're like, OK, that's cool. So let's restart the master and then say, OK. And then let's kill, actually, the slave and see what can be done. Because the system now is putting, you know, putting all the requests to the slave. So. And that's cool stuff to do, I think. A lot of people are pretty scared about resiliency and think it's very hard or takes a lot of time. But I think it's simply a master of, oops, sorry, I killed twice there. It's simply a master to get used to it. You know, you see now I have a failure of the slave. So basically, 
if I do a health, ch if I do a get product, well, I still get it because now the system realized, hey, my slave was down, so I set force to master. Uh, so sorry, my force to master is is here. All right, so. All these kind of stuff are very important, and there are simple things to do. Just put a master database, a slave, a health check. How do you implement that? And if you have failures, this is going to be the last thing I'm going to show. If you have systems that fail, you see, the first request takes long because there's a timeout involved, right? And health check, the second one needs to be fast because in an outage, you want your request and your health check to respond fast, and that's using caching, right? And it sounds simple, but I've been with many, many systems and customers, and health checks are usually often cases of doing outages uh, because either they don't do cash enough or then in a situation of an outage, they actually create even more constraint. And I think doing this kind of exercise is not chaos in the cloud or in production, but it's a very, very good introduction to resiliency. And I think it's a very, very good training for any developers that will eventually move to the cloud and use this system. And all that code is on GitHub, so you can all download that uh, if you're interested. There's a lot of the patterns I talked about today. On that note, thank you very much, and sorry for the time again. <laughs>